So this is a, a topic that I think should really dovetail very nicely with what Mary had already started for you guys. Um, intentionally, there's a little bit of overlap in here because if you're hearing some of this material for the first time, it can be a little bit confusing as you're trying to wrap your head around exactly how it fits together and what does this mean and how does this fit together and, and what's that all about. And so a lot of the material will be, um, again, very complementary. A little bit of cohesion, a little bit of overlap, laying that foundation so that we can go a little bit deeper into one very specific aspect of this process, desensitization and counter conditioning. And, and this was a topic that um, it's really important to me because when I'm working with clients, with the work that I do at the Animal Behavior Clinic, where we're doing interventions with clients who have animals who have specific behavioral concerns, desensitization and counter conditioning is, well, it's a huge part of the, the therapeutic work that we do. We do a lot of other things as well with medication and with management and other strategies, but when it comes to the, the behavior mod, this is probably the vast majority of it. And, and we tend to see um, misunderstanding. I tend to see some confusion from the clients, perhaps because they didn't get quite the education they needed from their trainer, or perhaps the training was excellence, and the client perception of it wasn't quite what it needed to be. And all of those things happen. So whatever le level we're looking at, I want to make sure that we're really talking about the same thing and getting these details nailed down right from the beginning. So that's sort of the impetus for this topic as we get started. So with that, one of the things that we may see within the practice is, you know, a dog who's afraid of kids. It certainly can happen. And we could replace kids with, with any number of things that dogs might be afraid of. But for our purposes here, we say, well, yeah, okay, your dog is afraid of kids. Well, what's there to be afraid of? Kids are fantastic. Kids love to play with dogs. They're going to blow bubbles for them. It's a wonderful time. Except sometimes it's not quite so wonderful. So we may have dogs who legitimately, you know, might like this. Maybe they even like this, but this might be a bit much. So we have dogs who are going to need some help getting through whatever their fear or anxiety or aggression issue may happen to be. And, and what I often hear, and again, this is reported from, from clients, so I'm not necessarily saying this is what they were told by their veterinarian or by their trainer, but what they relate to me is often something along the lines of this. So I went to my vet or I went to my trainer and they said, well, what we need to do is desensitize your dog to kids. That's going to help them learn to be not so afraid. And that's great. I can't argue with a single word up there. That's exactly what we want to do. But in many cases, that's where the conversation both started and ended. And so the client's going, yeah, I'm going to desensitize. Woohoo!" And they walk out the door and the door slams behind them and they think, I don't have a flipping clue what exactly it is I'm supposed to do next to make this happen. So yes, this is absolutely what we should be saying. We should be desensitizing. The question becomes how? And if we're leaving it there, we've got a big flaw in the system. And I, I love this photo because it, it sort of describes to me what the client version was of desensitization. Even when we sort of explain it in a little more detail, we say, well, okay, you start with what the puppy can handle and you work up to something that's a bit more challenging. And they say, well, I did that. I started in the parking lot and we marched right up to the water and we went right on in. But okay, um, not, not exactly what I meant, but what we need to work through is these details. And for you to understand it for your clients or for your friends or for your spouse or whoever you're explaining this to, to make sure that we're on the same page as to how this actually fits. So what I'm going to do with this topic today is we're going to break it down into sort of four sort of sections. I'm going to start with some of the concepts and definitions that I think are really relevant for this particular topic. I'm going to give you a very brief sort of formula that I use with the vast majority of my patients. It's a very simple formula. It's only got four or five steps, but it's something that can be adapted in an infinite number of ways, depending on the specific method or the animal or the specific thing that we're trying to accomplish. I'll give you some video examples of how some of these different techniques can get put together. Um, and then if we end up taking a break, it's gonna be sort of in here. And then I've got what I see as some of the more common errors that my clients come into me making or things that their, their trainer may have recommended or not, depending on how the case may be. So we're gonna go through that as our overview for today. 
So to get started, we're talking about concepts and definitions. This is the part where there may be some overlap with what Mary had talked about earlier. It should be very similar. Perhaps we may use some similar examples, some different examples, but it should be very cohesive. If there's anything that I say here that sort of creates a disconnect between your current understanding or perhaps something that Mary might have said, flag it, because there's probably some, some uh, questions. And we're probably both on the right track, but just looking at it from different angles. So if anything comes up, just raise that hand and we'll, we'll figure it out. So one of the definitions to start with is, is learning. And here I'm looking at that as a change in behavior based on past experience. And something that's important, again, always thinking about this from the desensitization and counterconditioning perspective, is that learning is always happening. Regardless of whether anybody is actively teaching, learning is constantly occurring. We're learning about, you know, kids running in the hallway. We're learning about, you know, how to get a, a bee out of the window. We're learning about, mmm, those gluten-free treats look really tasty. We're learning about the things around us. That's ongoing, regardless of whether someone is teaching. And that learning process is absolutely similar across the species. Very, very similar. The behavior patterns that are expressed by the individual may change, but the process of learning is very similar. So you can adapt this to almost anything that you may want to, uh, to, to, to expose to a learning experience. Now, the next detail that I want to look at for a desensitization and counter-conditioning perspective is talking about a stimulus gradient. And just to sort of lighten the mood just a little bit, we'll see if Grover wants to help Hello us out. Hello there. This is your old pal, Grover. Mm -hmm. Does anybody and remember today, this? I'm going to talk to you about near and far. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, little furry Grover, am going to show you near and far. Mm -hmm. Okay, here goes. First, this is near. Right here, near. Mm -hmm. This is far. This is near. You see? Very simple. Near and far. What we're talking about there in more technical terms is a stimulus gradient. In this case, we're talking about a stimulus gradient of distance. If you're someone who's a little bit afraid of Grover, and some people might be, <laughs> it's a little, little freaky, chances are far is a lot easier to handle than near. So when we're working with desensitization, we're starting at whatever is easier to handle. And we'll talk about that as we go through. The stimulus gradient can be varied in any number of dimensions. It could be related to proximity or distance. It might be related to the volume of, of noise or audio stimulation. It could be uh, the, the stimulus gradient of duration. If we're talking about petting, for example, one second, two second, three second, 32 second, three minutes duration of petting. It may refer to pressure in a lot of different ways. All of those things are things that can be manipulated through our desensitization uh, process. Sort of inherent within that stimulus gradient is the concept of threshold. The threshold is the point going from far to near, or loud to soft, or light to hard, or whatever the case may be. It's that point within that stimulus gradient where when it's exceeded or when we reach that threshold, something changes. With our, our veterinary patients, or my veterinary patients, I'm, I'm going to see that change usually as perhaps uh, a sign of fear or anxiety, perhaps avoidance, perhaps defensive aggression. It could be a lot of different things, but the threshold point is that point at which that change happens. And depending on the style of training we're doing, sometimes that might be referred to as the choice point or the, at the point at which the animal is making a conscious decision about what to do next. Um, and so again, this threshold is absolutely uh, an important detail. Now we talked a little bit about reinforcement already, sort of strengthening or increasing behavior. I'll give you a practical example here. Okay, we're going to start getting him used to just being up here. His last experience on the groom table was probably not. We started simply by clicking Tucker for being calm and relaxed in the middle of the grooming table. I'm going to run my hand down his paw. Good. 
just for you, I'm going to reward letting me handle his feet. Not this last night, let's just make his hook. So if he, if he pulls back, if he gives me something less than I'm thrilled with, I just don't click that. You get your foot back, but you also don't get a cookie for that one. The release of the paw is also reinforcement for Tucker, but by keeping the training sessions so relaxed, the relief from the release of his paw is relatively minor compared to the disappointment at the lack of a click and a bit of liver. And because, because he's a participant here, he's not a victim, nobody's doing this to him, he's choosing to let me have his paw, he's got no reason to fight it. You know, it's, it, this was his idea in the first place. Good puppy! Soon, Tucker is voluntarily lifting his paw, and in a few moments, I've begun handling the paw he's chosen to offer me. Good job! So this combines a couple of different elements of reinforcement. Now there's also desensitization and counter conditioning happening here as well. But the idea being here, the consequence, the click and the treat, using the marker that Mary talked about, the consequence strengthens or increases the likelihood of a behavior happening again. That's really the, the basis of reinforcement. We're usually using things that are pleasant or enjoyable to the animal. Um, we're often using things like food. In the scientific literature, they'll look at primary reinforcers saying it's food, air, or water. I usually just, well, use food. I'm not going to necessarily allow them to breathe as a reinforcement. Um, so it's a little, little weird. But food, primary reinforcer. Secondary reinforcers are things like the clicker, something where we had to actively condition that association. Um, and we can use those in a variety of combinations. Something that's intrinsic to remember about reinforcement is that it, whatever it is that we're using, play, praise, petting, food, whatever the reinforcement is, has to be reinforcing to that individual in that situation, in that moment, in that context. Um, for example, if you have a dog who just finished the biggest meal of their life and I'm waving a liver treat in front of their nose, unless it's a Labrador or a Beagle, <laughs> I may be out of luck. You know, if it's a sight hound, we might as well not even get started. So it varies depending on what their motivation is to get that reinforcement. And also, if you have some dogs who are um, perhaps allergic, where their skin is actually really itchy or uncomfortable, or perhaps physical contact is a bit scary, even though some dogs love petting, that may not be a reinforcement for others. So reinforcement can be very specific to the individual, and we want to be just at least a bit aware of that as we get started with this process. Now on the flip side, as Mary talked about as well, we have punishment, some sort of consequence that decreases the probability, the strength, or the likelihood of a behavior. It's usually something aversive or unpleasant. Same caveat goes along with punishment, as what I mentioned for reinforcement. Even though we might say that, you know, kneeing a dog in the chest or yelling at them in a really stern voice is a punishment. Uh, has anybody worked with perhaps a young Labrador or a young Pity where you say, no bad dog, and they say, yes, <laughs> bring it. Yeah, not a punishment, not a punishment. In fact, it's probably the opposite. It's probably a reinforcer. So we have to look at what exactly the animal's perception of that stimulus is. And some of the examples are listed here. Again, Mary went through those very, very well already. Uh, I will mention a couple of things here. Punishment, when it is used successfully and correctly, is actually a very reliable, fast way to change behavior. It's actually a really beautiful technique. The challenge and there are lots of them. The biggest challenge is that it's really very, very difficult in real life circumstances as life is happening. It's extremely difficult to control the environment, to control the correction, to control the consequences, controlling the timing, the consistency, all of that in a way that allows for that sort of pure learning to happen. The unfortunate part about that is that if we do it anyway, and we're using a correction of any sort, we're using some sort of aversive, but perhaps without good timing, without consistency, or without that perfect level of, of effectiveness, now we're doing something unpleasant in a way that may be perceived as the animal by the animal as unpredictable, unavoidable, or of the wrong intensity. And that, unfortunately, is one of the fastest ways to create or exacerbate fear, anxiety, avoidance, 
defensive behaviors, and the list goes on and on. So I'm not going to be one who says punishment doesn't work. When it's done correctly, it works beautifully. It's just really difficult to do. And the consequences are so significant as to make that technique almost almost impossible, or at least highly impractical for the average person and even the majority of skilled trainers to use effectively. So for my purposes, I recognize the value of it and use it very, very sparingly, if at all, within treatment. It's not that it doesn't work, but we have to be very careful. Now, there's another concept that I'm just going to introduce a little bit here, which is the idea of a functional reward. And this is something that we, we, we really start to incorporate as we get into higher levels of training, that rather than using food for all of our, our dogs that we're training or using the same reinforcement, we start to really, well, we start to really listen to the dog or the animal that we're working with, and we ask them, it may sound a little silly to say it that way, but we ask them, what matters most to you right here in this moment? If you're hungry, then food matters. If you're afraid of that child, then distance is probably the most important reinforcement right now. Um, if you're a Labrador and you love attention and your attention's starved, as many of them are, then praise works beautifully. But we ask them, what matters most to you? Now, obviously, we're not just asking them the question, but we're looking at their behavior and seeing what effect different reinforcers have. That's the concept of a functional reward. The beautiful thing about functional rewards is when you start to really embrace this idea, you can turn almost every situation into a training opportunity. Because if my dog really wants to go outside, opening the door is a reward. If my dog really wants to go for a walk, then putting on the leash is the reward. If my dog wants to climb up into my lap, then that's a reward too. And so I can strengthen the behaviors I want by using the rewards that matter most to that animal. It's a little bit more complicated than just using a straightforward food or toy, but it's a beautiful concept. And if it's something that you haven't really encountered before in your, in your own sort of personal education, I highly encourage you to read a bit more about it. And I can get you some resources for that later on if you're interested. Um, so with that in mind, um, before I get into the details of the desensitization piece, I wanted to spend one slide talking about this. Now, when we talk about training and desensitization, we spend a lot of time talking about how to introduce the child or that shoreline or whatever it is that we're introducing. We talk a lot about how to introduce that in a structured way. In between training sessions, it's critically important that we're actually avoiding that trigger. Because if we're exposing the animal to that trigger in an uncontrolled, over-threshold, threatening, scary, overstimulating sort of a way, we're actually setting that animal up to practice doing it wrong when I'm not actually teaching them. So they're learning when I'm not teaching rather than learning while I am teaching. So avoidance is critical to a well-implemented desensitization and counter-conditioning program. Um, and and I'll, I'll touch base on this a little bit later, but it's actually one of the biggest mistakes that I see clients making is they're not prioritizing this enough. And then their training isn't effective because the dog is actually practicing doing it wrong more than they're practicing doing it right. So this is an important concept, and we can talk a little bit more about that in detail as we go through. So now we get on to the nuts and bolts that we actually are here to talk about, which is desensitization. And that is truly the piece of this puzzle where we're starting with a low intensity exposure followed by a gradual increase in that stimulus intensity, hopefully below threshold, below that point where the animal is going to react in a negative way. And anybody over threshold yet? <laughs> Anyone? Okay, so we'll take that back down to a more appropriate level. We want to start at whatever level is comfortable. For some of you, that might be here. For some, it might be you know, the drawing of a circle with eight little lines on it. <laughs> Way over there. <laughs> Everybody's a little bit different, and so are our, our, our patients or our, our the animals that we're working with. So we start with what they are comfortable handling. We increase the intensity as they are capable of handling it. That's the desensitization piece. 
that is very different from habituation. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later. Um, But just to point that out, that is an important detail. It is different from just habituating or getting used to something. The counter-conditioning piece is exactly the $20 bill example that Mary gave. If we are trying to expose someone to the spider, we find out what matters to them. Maybe it's a $20 bill. Maybe it's the best piece of chocolate you've ever tasted in your life. Whatever it is for you, or in the case of the patient that we're working with, we figure out what matters to them, and we put those two things together. Stimulus and some sort of associated cue, hopefully leading to a positive conditioned emotional response or a smiley face, as the case may be. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. The general rule here is we're changing either their emotional or and or their behavioral response. And whether we're focusing more on the emotion or the specific behavior puts us into one category of counterconditioning or another. And we'll talk about that next. Classical conditioning is the first example we'll talk about. And this is what Mary was referring to with the... uh, There we go. Everyone knows a cat that reliably comes when it hears a can of food opening. They come running because they associate the sound with tasty food. That's it. (laughs) Hear the can. You like it. That's the gist of classical conditioning. This is the same thing that's happening with the click, treat, click, treat, click, treat. We're not asking the animal to do anything. We're not requiring anything of them. We're simply associating two stimuli together. That's Pavlovian conditioning. And there's a lot of complicated jargon that really describes exactly what happens. I'm not going to worry about that for today. Just know that we're associating those two things together. Now, if we flip this just a little bit differently and we require something, now we're talking about operant conditioning. To train a cat or kitten to sit, start when it's hungry and use a portion of its meal or treats. This is this kitten's breakfast. Kittens love to sit compared to dogs, so all you have to do is wait until they sit and get the treat to them. Then, after they've eaten a few bites, remove the treats far enough away so that they don't climb you to get to them. Then reward them intermittently while they're still sitting. This is how you train kittens to be calm and polite. Be sure to remove your hand and treat if they raise their paw to grab or they meow, so that you don't accidentally reward these demand behaviors. It's also a good idea to practice a lot the first several days so that you don't accidentally develop sloppy technique and end up rewarding the wrong behaviors. If you reward good sit behavior as much as a hundred times a day, you can quickly make the polite sit a habit. You can also teach the kitten to follow you and sit patiently when she catches up. This will be useful for training her to walk on leash both inside and outside the house. So a couple of these clips, and there's one or two more that are uh, later on in the the presentation, are from Dr. Sophia Yin, who has just a great collection of materials available on her website in some of the books and other DVDs that she's put out there. Um, I do have her permission to use these clips as long as I say her name and promote her materials. So she's very generous in that way, and she's got just an amazing library of resources. So I just want to give her the credit for that. So in this case, we're requiring a specific behavior. By rewarding it when it happens, we're strengthening that behavior. Not just the emotional state, but the actual behavioral response. And that's exactly what's happening here. And there's a lot of different principles that go along with that that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here today. But those are some of the details that we're working on as we're building up to actually implementing desensitization and counter conditioning. Now, does anybody have any questions about any of the sort of the definitions or the the, the principles that we've talked about so far? Any questions? Excellent. Then we're going to move on and put it into the formula. (laughs) Are you sure you don't have any questions at all? I promise it's not nearly this complicated. If it was, I couldn't do it either. This is really the formula. 
and I'm going to put this slide up a couple of times. You'll get a chance to see it. The gist of it is four steps. The first one is we identify a few details. We're identifying the stimulus, child, spider, noise. We're identifying the, the problem, in this case probably the problem behavior. You know, animal is panting, animal is digging to get out of a crate, animal is lunging at or away from something. And then we identify what our goal is. What do we want this animal to do instead? And that's really something that, you know, at the beginning, our, our clients are usually able to identify most of the time. And so we, we just help them nail that down. This is what's going on. This is the trigger. This is the problem. This is our, our goal and what we want to do. The next piece is that management or avoidance step. Say, well, the first thing we want to do next as we move on to step two is avoid that stimulus, avoid that problem, avoid that scenario whenever we're not actively training. There's a lot of steps that can go into that by itself, but that's our step two. Number three is we set up some sort of controlled exposure, some sort of training session, a setup, an, a real-life opportunity, whatever makes sense for that particular stimulus or problem. And then we, we do some sort of training or reinforcement or, in rare, rare, rare cases, some sort of punishment or consequence. So rare as to not even be talked about today. But in those situations, we're creating an emotional response that works for us or we're creating a behavioral response that is appropriate. And we're reinforcing or strengthening that. And then it's a matter of repeating. And that's really it. Identify, avoid, set up, repeat. If you really break it down to that level, you can start to get the, the nuts and bolts of, a, of an appropriate desensitization program, even without knowing a lot of the technical jargon or a lot of the other concepts really break it down to the point where it's simple. Now I'm going to show you a couple of video examples of, of how this might look in real life situations. So this is an example, a colleague of mine who has a, a relatively new puppy and she wants to make sure that this puppy is comfortable having people approach, perhaps um, you know, be near the food bowl while the puppy is eating. And so she's starting out you know, at, a, at a level, at an intensity level that the puppy can handle. And she's associating her presence with something enjoyable. In this case, it's a higher value food treat than what's in the bowl. So when I'm near your bowl, good things happen. What we want to do over the course of some of these repetitions is get the puppy to think, huh, I've got my nose in the bowl, but when you show up, you're actually way more interesting than the food. And you can see the puppy's interest actually shifting away from the food over towards the person. So this is a way to start a desensitization program even before we've identified a problem necessarily. Our problem is more prevention in this case. And what we're trying to get to, again, is, is that conditioned emotional response. I am approached at a food bowl. I expect good things to happen. Look at that tail wagging. In this case, it actually does mean I'm happy to see you. Now, she's working her way up the stimulus gradient. She stepped away only to return again. It's a little bit more intense to approach rather than just stand there. It's more intense to reach down and touch the bowl rather than just call the puppy away. So we're, she's incorporating that stimulus gradient along the way. Now, has anybody uh, heard in, in, their, in their history or their experience that when you have a puppy and you want to teach them how to not be a food garter, what you should do is actually just mess with their food while they're eating and pick up the food bowl and, and just be, be a part of that experience so that they just figure out, hey, there's no need to be worried about this. Has anybody ever heard that? Has anybody implemented that and have it, have it work successfully? It, it can. It can actually work really, really well. It, it actually can work really, really well in a lot of cases. The challenge, and it, the cases where it tends to work really well are those puppies who are sort of like, cool, you're at my food bowl. I could care less. Let's eat. It's a non-issue from the beginning, and so they just sort of get used to you being there. 
The problem and where that technique tends to fail a little bit is if we have a puppy who's a little bit insecure about their food, which is sort of like me going into a really nice restaurant when I'm really hungry after a good long hike in the gorge. I really am really waiting for my dinner. And so now if that waiter starts coming over and messing with my food or sort of just lingering a little bit while I'm standing there eating, I'm going to start to get a little bit protective. And that's exactly what happens with our puppies, too, if they're not completely neutral about food to begin with. So does it work? Yes. Can it backfire? Absolutely. And it's actually, in, in my experience, when I see resource guarding dogs later on, it's one of the most common parts of their history. That the owner said, well, yeah, my, my trainer, or, the, or you know, maybe I've done this with my last five dogs, and it worked beautifully, just like it did for all of you who raised your hands that it worked for you. So as long as you get lucky with the right dog, you're totally fine. <laughs> it's when we end up with the wrong combination that we can run into a little bit more of a problem. The beautiful thing about a technique more along this line is that whether that puppy is insecure or completely comfortable, this one's still going to work for you. So you can get that sort of, you know, you don't have to necessarily think about which puppy you have. You just start at whatever level that puppy's comfortable and you work forward from there. So for me, if I have a sort of a foolproof solution to a problem, I'm taking it. That's the one I'm going to recommend. So for my purposes, this is where I tend to go more so than just the get used to it strategy. So um, anybody, quest anybody have questions about the differences between those two sort of methods for that specific scenario? No. Okay. So I'm going to give you another example that's relatively similar. Okay, ready? Mm -hmm. Little higher value resource. Now we've got an actual tasty bone. Still a puppy. This is preventative. It's a little bit more intense than where we started with the other puppy. In this case, we're already at the point of actually taking that item away. With this puppy, it very quickly figures out, gosh, if I just take my nose off of that toy when you approach, good things happen. Yay. And guess what? I'm getting my bone back, so I have no reason to be worried about it. It's like a double bonus. Sweet. Get an extra, and I get the thing that I really wanted right back. Okay. When we're doing this with puppies, it usually goes really, really fast. Sometimes we up the ante a little bit with peanut butter. <laughs> peanut butter can be great. And then we've completely lost focus on the training exercise altogether. So it's not always the right way to go. But again, we're, we're working at that from that same idea of working at the puppy, in this case, experience or um, comfort level, setting it up, teaching them what we want to do, associating with something positive, and repeating. You notice in, multi in both of those situations, there were multiple repetitions right in a row. It's a great way to get a great number of trials within a short period of time when we can set it up that way. Now, I'm gonna go on to the next one because sometimes we're not working with puppies. Sometimes we're working with adult dogs with a bite history. So this is Abby, and of course, some of us might think, how could a golden retriever possibly have a bite history? Um, this is Abby, and this is her owner, Anne. Um, Abby had a history before this point of when approached or, well, approached, touched, um, really, and by approach I mean within 20 feet or so, if someone approached within that bubble, she would leave her food bowl, charge them, and bite them and draw blood. Not this sweet Abby. Yes, this sweet Abby, that was a part of her history. And so when we started with Abby, and I'm gonna pause this for just a second. When we started with Abby, we were all the way over in this other side of the room here. And the routine that we used with Abby, I mean, this isn't a perfect solution for every dog, but in this case, this is what we chose to do. We started with Abby. Abby has a tremendous history of obedience training, wonderfully trained in many other aspects. Um, and what we started out by doing was we started with her in a sit all the way over on the other side of the room. There was a sit and a stay. The owner walked over here, put a single, low-value, boring, prescription food diet, about as low-level as you can get, 
into that kibble or into that food bowl, walked back to the walked back to Abby, gave her a release command, and Abby walked over, got her piece of kibble, and then came back. What you see the owner doing in this case is that when Abby comes back, assuming that she stays relaxed through that whole process, she gets the double bonus. In this case, it was a little bit of banana, which she really, really loves. So it's, it's structured. We're not pushing her limits. We're working at an intensity that she can handle, and she's getting the reward for staying relaxed. As she was comfortable with that and settled into the routine, we got closer and closer and closer and closer until we're able to be working right up and around the food bowl. So this is that stimulus gradient. Now we're right there at the food bowl with her. She's released. She gets to eat her kibble. And she will get the reward. Now at this point, we've already increased some of the other details where she's getting more than just a single kibble. And the owner has worked up to the point of stepping away and returning. All of these things make the exercise more challenging. This is not where we started with Abby, but it's where they were able to work up to. As we're doing this for a dog with this sort of a history, we're watching for relaxed body language, a nice neutral tail set, tail carriage, relaxed ears. She's attentive. She's not changing the speed or the intensity of eating while this exercise is happening. If anything, her attention is far more interested in hoping that her owner comes back with that little bit of banana. Now, with desensitization and counter conditioning, we have to, well, we have to incorporate all of the variables. Both Anne and Stan had to do this. They had to work from both sides of the food bowl because you never know which area you might approach from. And so we worked through all of these different details as part of the desensitization and counter conditioning program. The beautiful thing about doing an exercise like this, and there's an infinite number of ways that this might be implemented, but the beautiful thing about this is that if you do it this way, and if you do it correctly, how often do we actually trigger aggression? Hopefully, never. And we get to a point where, prior to passing away, Abby was completely reliable. We worked through this training for a period of time, they would do this maybe once a week as just a little brush up prior to one of her meals, just as a maintenance training. And if they needed to reach into her food bowl, if they needed to approach her at the food bowl, that was okay. Because every time they walked up, her butt's wiggling. There must be a banana there somewhere. And that's the conditioned emotional response that we created for her. So with desensitization, yes, we can do that preventatively, working up to our goals, or we can do it therapeutically as well. And we're really doing exactly the same steps. The difference is perhaps where we're able to start. So as we do that, if you think about those two examples, two times at the food bowl and then once with the rawhide, this is what we're doing. We identify the details, avoid uncontrolled exposure. In Abby's case, if they didn't have time to do the training, then she was fed in the kitchen and there were baby gates up. And nobody entered the kitchen until she was done. End of story. If they needed to enter the kitchen, they would go to the back door, take the gate down, open the back door, and call her to go outside. Once she was outside, close the door, go back and do what they needed to do. So never approaching the food bowl unless they were actively training in the way that we talked about, and they repeated it until she was reliable. So it's exactly the same principle working through each of those examples. Same idea, and these are both from, from Sophia Yin, this dog is afraid of metal grates. Some people might try to flood her by just dragging her over it, but this could backfire and may make her worse. Instead, I'm going to use operant counter conditioning. I'll target her closer and closer to the grate until she steps on it repeatedly. I'm having her target in rapid succession at whatever distance she's comfortable. Even though this is operant counter conditioning and our goal is to have her perform a behavior repeatedly, we also want her to enjoy performing the behavior so that we also change her underlying emotional state. (laughs) 
Talk about a threshold. So she didn't push at that moment. That would have been too much. Just a little bit more help. Oh. So she gets a jackpot. Are we done? Once she's on the grate, I give her additional treats Not in rapid yet. succession so she learns to associate good things with sitting on the grate. Now I'm afraid to move on the grate. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> now you'll see as she comes back... Next, I repeat the procedure with yet. a different grate. She's like, I did it once, but that doesn't mean I can faster. trust that grate not to cave into the center of the universe. So we have to keep practicing until it's no longer an issue. It's easier, but it's not. she's not done yet. She's not completely at the point where this is a no big deal. Little moment of hesitation, just being aware of it, but she steps right on. Now she's pretty now comfortable, we're doing well. and we've only trained her for a total of six minutes. She'll still go around if she can, <laughs> but she figures it out. You know, these are these. Are, when you do this correctly, you can often be very efficient about it. We could have taken 30 seconds and pushed her onto the grate, and we would have accomplished the goal of dog on crate. Great, excuse me. Dog on crate is a whole other issue. But I guess you could use the same example, dog in crate versus dog on grate. If we force it, we accomplish the end goal. But the next time around, if it was an unpleasant, stressful experience, we tend to get more pushback rather than more comfort, like we're seeing with this dog. So what the, the keys that you see there, she was always, always pushing just that little bit, keeping the progress going, but never pushing beyond the point at which the dog could be successful. And that's where some of the art comes into play with this, is that you have to be willing to be flexible as a trainer, as an owner, as a handler, as an educator. You have to be flexible enough to, to push when you need to and back off when it's too much. I use some of these examples because this is really practical for us in the veterinary clinic. If we pretend that grate was a, uh, a scale in the lobby, it's a great example. This dog is fearful at the veterinary hospital. During the last visit, she had to be held struggling and mouthing in order to get her blood. Here she is in the exam room. She sort of tucked back in. It's important to approach backwards in this tiny room and to avoid making eye contact. Once you're close enough, you can counter condition to petting. This is how she acts if she's greeted head on. She's more comfortable when the doctor is facing sideways. Part of the desensitization sideways. and finding that threshold. Find what the dog is comfortable with. We'll come back to the food in a second. Remember to stop petting before you run out of treats. This dog looks nervous as the veterinarian continues to pet her. Also, remove your hand as soon as you're finished giving the treats. They may be okay with your hand while they're dun, getting dun, treats, dun. but when they're finished getting treats, they may remember that they're scared. So is food the only reinforcer? No, we've talked about this already. We've got a lot of different options, and we can leverage them based on the animal. And when it comes to what we're training the animal to do, in Abby's case, you saw a lot of the sit behavior, sit and then visual attention. We can use any number of things, the sit, a down, watch me, teaching the animal to actually look at the trigger and then reorient back to handler. Dr. Yin was using a touch or a target style of training. In some cases, we're using a relaxed down, which we can call any number of things to get that arousal level under control. We can use all of these pieces, but we typically don't have to use all of these pieces. We'll pick one or two that feels most relevant. In the case of that, that dog with the floor grate, touch was a perfect choice. I'm assuming, because Dr. Yin has been working with that dog, the dog knows probably 97 commands by the time she got that dog on video. But 
The only ones she needed really was the touch. We could jump right into that, and most dogs can learn that in a very short period of time if that's the most relevant. So we pick up something that is appropriate for that particular situation. Now, if you think about this idea of, of setting up a desensitization and counterconditioning program using these principles, you know, we can do that in so, so many different scenarios. And I, I list a couple of them here. It could be for some of our dogs who have separation anxiety and we're trying to teach them how to be comfortable when we leave them. We can set up a plan there. If it's a dog who's reacting aggressively to passersby, we can use the principles there. Reactivity to dogs on a walk or perhaps exuberant greetings with family members. We can do that exact same thing in all of these scenarios, which is why it's such a valuable tool. I can start with one thing that I know really well, and I know all of these other tools as well, so I can decide if by chance I need to pull something else in. But the vast majority of the time, we can really do some amazing, amazing work with that core understanding. And that's why it's such an important principle to understand. Now, we're going to move on to troubleshooting. So we've got this list. I'm not going to go into this right now because we're going to go through each one of these individually. These are not necessarily in a particular order. They're just 10 different details. So don't think about them as being ranked 1 through 10. They're just all important things that we see. If you think back, and I'm going to rewind just a couple of slides here for just a second. If we go back to this formula, number three is the setup. One of the errors that we see is when people are trying to rely because they're busy, because they're distracted, because they forgot. They're trying to rely on real life situations for their training. And there's a couple of challenges that we have there um, is that in most cases, if we're doing training within real life situations, we don't necessarily have as much control over what's happening around us. If I was trying to, for example, desensitize a dog to the sound of children running in a hallway, for example, and we were doing that an hour ago, and all of a sudden the herd of elephants goes running by, boom, we just blew our training session out of the water because we weren't prepared. So yeah, real life is going to happen, and we have to find that balance. But it is important to set that up as much as we possibly can so we can control that intensity, work up that stimulus gradient appropriately. And the beautiful thing there, too, is if you think back to the, the food bowl with the puppy, with Winnie, and the, uh, the, uh, the rawhide with little Tug, you saw the number of repetitions. Because it was a setup, she's like, okay, I'm ready to go. I've got peanut butter. I've got my regular food. I'm in an office. Nobody's going to bother us. I can do this, and I can do 8, 10, 12, 15, 30, if that's appropriate, repetitions in a very short period of time. So you can really maximize training. That's the other advantage. Um, and so we have to be able to set it up in a way that everybody can be successful. The other downside of trying to train in real life is that in most cases, my clients are not skilled trainers when we get started. So if they're trying to think their way through a real life situation that's happening on the fly, they can't do it. Eventually, many of them get to that point where they can, but when we're just getting started, no, it's not an option. They're gonna end up being reactive and stressed and you know tugging and jerking and then there's a pile of food on the floor and then they think, I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> Whew, but we survived. Okay, that's not, not desensitization and counter conditioning. What I tell my clients in many cases is, you know, if the disaster drill is another dog, you know, right in front of their face or the mailman or the delivery person coming to the door, we have to practice the disaster drill first. We think back to elementary school when you're practicing disaster drills. Was that at full speed? No. There was an advance notice. At 10 a.m., there's going to be a disaster drill. The bell will ring. We will line up in a single file and we will walk to this specific area so everybody knows what's going on, and then it happens and we practice it. Did we practice it once? No. Maybe one time that day, because, oh my God, it's like four hours out of the day to do that. But after that, we have to do it again, because someone wasn't paying attention, somebody forgot, somebody... You gotta do it over and over again so that in the disaster, you actually have a plan to fall back on. That's the key of doing setups. We are doing disaster drills, so we're ready for the disaster when it actually happens. Hopefully it's not an actual disaster, but we've got to be prepared. Now, this is something that I see a lot, 
not necessarily Goldens who can balance 1,700 treats on their nose, but using food as a distraction rather, rather than as true reinforcement. One way to really recognize this distinction is that if you're using food, even if you're doing a sit or a watch me, but if you're using food to keep your dog busy, but at, the, at no point in the training are they really making the decision of what to do when the stimulus occurs. They're just preoccupied. That's not really desensitization and counter conditioning in the pure sense. It does help for a lot of dogs, and certainly keeping them busy through a disaster is probably better than letting them react. But if that's all that we're doing is sit, watch, sit, watch, sit, watch, sit, watch while something is happening over there, that's not exactly teaching the dog what to do when the spider or the child or the off-leash dog shows up. We do need to have a stimulus response. Whether the response is emotional or behavioral, there needs to be that connection for this process to actually happen. So what we're often looking for in a setup is we're trying to time our training right at the moment where the animal notices. So for example, if I'm working with one dog over here, we'll pretend for the second that it's a leash reactive dog, and we've got our stimulus or our decoy dog coming in from a distance, I may be working with this dog as we slowly bring that other dog in right to the point where my patient goes, oh. <laughs> and it's just that little subtle, sometimes it's just a little bit of a head raise, sometimes it's a freezing of the tail, just a little subtle something. That's the moment where they are trying to make a decision about, okay, do I need to run? Do I need to lunge? What do I do next? That's really the, the moment where they're most receptive to learning what to do. Now, I'll be honest, for some of these patients, that moment sort of comes and goes very, very quickly in the reactive display. So I'm not saying it's always easy to time that, but that's the ideal. If all we're doing is keeping them busy, it helps but there's going to be a point at which the animal doesn't make additional progress for many of our patients. So really making sure that we're going back to the principles of teaching them what to do and rewarding them for a very specific response. This is the management piece. This was rule number two in those steps. We have to make sure that we're avoiding when we're not training. And I've mentioned this a, a couple of times already. This is even more important for the fear or anxiety behaviors because if we're triggering a negative emotional state or if we're allowing the animal to be reinforced for driving the mailman away six days a week, we're not going to make progress with our training that we do Sunday morning. We're just not. And so we have to be able to manage appropriately using whatever's appropriate for that environment and for that problem. So that is definitely a big troubleshooting piece that we want to pay attention to. When I'm working with handlers, um, in some cases maybe trainers, it may be veterinarians, it may be owners, where we're trying to do this sort of training, they have to be able to recognize what that alert moment looks like. And it may be a little bit different for each dog. Or if it's not a dog at all, but it's a parrot. Or if it's a horse or if it's another species entirely, we have to be able to recognize that. So there may be a little bit of education that we have to get for ourselves or perhaps our, our clients if we're working with others about how to read and interpret those body language cues. And we figure out which signals for that animal are predictive of that reaction. So we can head it off before it ever gets to that point where they're doing the thing we didn't want them to do in the first place. And this does take practice. And some dogs are really good at signaling. Others are <laughs> really bad at it. Either they're very stoic and you don't see much of anything, or they're sort of all over the map, and it's hard to pinpoint one particular signal. But we've got to be able to identify that so we can get that moment. So if that's a piece that our client is missing, then we'll have to do some education there. When, um, when we're using any sort of training exercise, Mary alluded to this a little bit when she was talking about the lure reward training is that if we're trying to lure and then reward a particular behavior, there's a danger of leaving that lure there too long. Well, this is sort of the opposite problem, is we think, oh, he sat and watched me with the dog 100 yards away three times. Cool. I don't need to bring food on my walks anymore. Well, probably not. 
there's a, there's a pretty big distance here. The dog has been successful three times, practiced lunging and barking 7,042 times. We probably haven't tipped that scale in the direction we want it to go quite yet. So we want to be careful that we're not luring unnecessarily and becoming dependent on those cues. But at the same point, we want to make sure that we're giving the reinforcement for the behavior, whether that's food, praise, tug, petting, whatever it is for that particular animal. We want to make sure they're doing it. And this is a really important detail because dogs especially, and this is true of all all creatures that respond to, to, to training and are, and are capable of learning, we all adapt to our current conditions. If I know, you know, if I'm the dog and if I know right now, if I sit and watch, I get a cookie, it's worth doing. And if I practice that enough, it starts to become my pattern. But if at some point the cookies stop happening and my handler is just sort of expecting me to be good, maybe I'm not quite so interested in sitting and looking at my handler anymore because I'm not getting rewarded for that anymore. We adapt to the current conditions. This is a good thing for most of our patients. It means that we can implement training and expect them to respond. It also means that we stop training. They may revert back, especially if there's still an emotional response that we haven't dealt with yet at that point in training. So we want to make sure we keep pushing enough, but don't rely too much on those lures right from the beginning. This sort of goes along with the setups um, in, in terms of ne needing to be proactive. When we're actively training with a dog, and I'm not saying that we necessarily need to be the pack leader or anything along those lines, but we do need to be proactive about giving them directions. If I want my dog to sit and watch me, it's my job to know that, and it's my job to cue it or at least be ready to reward it when it happens later on in training. So I have to be at least somewhat proactive. And being proactive is really hard. I don't know if any of you have tried doing this with your kids, with your dogs, with your spouse, with your, with your any, coworkers, employees. I mean, it's really hard to always be one step ahead. But for many of these behavior problems, if we're one step behind, it's really hard to make a dent. So being proactive is a piece that I'm looking for. And for all of these steps, there are all of these um, troubleshooting details that I'm looking for, not every one of these is appropriate for every one of my patients. These are the things that I'm looking for when I went through a plan and I expected a dog to respond appropriately and that's not happening. I'm running through this list to try to figure out what, what we missed or what's not getting implemented. So, you know, in being proactive, all of those difficulties are there, and it's really hard for people to figure out what proactive means. I remember one, one case in particular stands out in my mind. I was called out to evaluate a, a couple of uh, female Wheaton Terriers who were fighting with one another. And I was within the household, and we were talking about things, and it was a relatively straightforward case, and I had a very, in my head, a very clear treatment plan that m should work. And we were t talking first about being proactive and managing. And, and I had used the word proactive several times. And at some point, the owner, she stopped me. And she said, well, but when you say proactive, what do you mean? And I thought she was looking for specific examples. And when I tried to clarify, she said, no, 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 proactive. Like, what, what, what does that mean? Wow. Huh. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and and I, I sort of paused for a second. And I looked around. And I thought, you know, yeah, actually, now that you mention it, the, you know, the, there is sort of a, a half cleaned up stain on the floor. Your dishes are sort of in the sink with dishwater. So they're neither started nor done. Like it, it was sort of everything was in between. And, and it really dawned on me that at that moment, that woman is living a completely 100% reactive lifestyle. And that completely changed the prognosis for that entire case. She was not going to be capable of being proactive if she couldn't do it in her own life, in her kid's life, in her dog's daily life as an individual couldn't do it. So it is hard. And for some clients, it's actually impossible at the point where we're starting treatment to be proactive. But if we can't do it, that's a problem. Our training is not going to work the way we need it to. Now, I mentioned this one before, confusing desensitization with habituation. The difference here, if we think about those spiders, you know, sort of the, the difference intensity up to the, the big spider and all the way back down again, habituation is 
exposing an animal at a at least a moderate intensity and just expecting them to get used to it. Habituation is what we're accounting on with the puppy at the food bowl when we're just sort of messing with them. We expect them to just go, yeah, this happens every day and it's no big deal. Habituation is what happens when we move into a new house next to uh, a rail yard and we've got sort of the banging of the cars and things. You hear it at first, but then you tune it out. That's habituation. That absolutely happens. It's a very reliable style of learning and a, a way to change responses. For animals, especially those with reactive, fearful, or anxiety-based patterns, aggression in many cases, habituation doesn't work very well. Because when those situations occur, they're a big deal. It'd be like saying, oh, you're going to get used to the sound of the rail yard when, in fact, your experience with trains was that you know you were waiting at a crossing area and the train derailed in front of you. And now I'm saying, oh, don't worry about the train. It, it, it's totally fine. It's not a big deal. And your body's telling you, oh, no, no. <laughs> it's a really big deal. Habituation is less likely to happen. So for our patients who experience that it's really a big deal for whatever reason, it's really a big deal, we can't just necessarily expect them to get over it just by exposing them over and over again. It's not necessarily going to happen. It can, but we don't want to rely on it. So we have to go back to desensitization, take it back down to an intensity level that the animal can actually handle, and work forward from there. We can also expect too much too soon. And we see this all the time where clients are making progress at home and they say, yeah, he can do the relax down. Let me show you. And they're cueing it, fluffy, down. Down! He can do it at home. Down! <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not relaxed anymore. <laughs> Woo! No, I, I get it. Your dog can do this at home. You sent me a video. I believe you. But right now, your dog may love this hug right here at home, but not right here right now. So we want our patients to be better, and we want to show others that they are better, and we want other people to see the dog that we get to know and love, and so we, we project a lot. And we're, most of us are guilty of this to some degree. I certainly am as well. And so we have to make sure that we're, we're expecting, we're setting expectations based on what that animal is capable of doing. If we set our expectations too low, they're not going to make that much progress, or it's going to be very slow. But if we set our expectations too high, they actually fail. And then we're frustrated. The bond gets a little bit more damaged. Our training gets a little bit less productive. And we're slipping down that slope, leading to one of the last points that Mary made, which was, yeah, training issues or behavior problems be one of the leading cause of euthanasia. So anything that affects that is worth paying attention. So if I see this pattern, yeah, we're, 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 we're a bit off in our expectation setting then we've got to go back and, and re-examine exactly what that means for that particular patient. We also have to practice. And we talked about this a little bit before with two minutes a day versus three hours a day. If we're not practicing, we can't expect improvements, but there is going to be a balance. For me, the balance is within training and management and helping clients to understand they will get back what they put into it, provided that we've got all of these pieces taken care of. Um, and so the, the, the practice is definitely a big part. <laughs> Lingering is another detail. You saw this in one of the videos with Dr. Yin, where the veterinarian who was doing this for the first time gave the dog a food treat and then just sort of hung out there. That's sort of like working with a leash-reactive dog. We're at the park. I've asked my dog to sit because there's a dog approaching. I've asked my dog to sit, pay attention, and I give it a cookie, and I'm thinking, we got this. My dog is awesome. Meanwhile, that other dog is still approaching. At some point, we're no longer below threshold. I lingered. Oops. So if we're staying in that situation too long and accidentally putting the animal over threshold, it wasn't a terribly productive training session. So if we see that happening, we need to go back to our setups and see how do we avoid that the next time around. So what I've given you with this list of 10 is probably the, the 10 most common errors or um, missing pieces that we tend to see when what we think is a good plan is not working. These are the ones that clients, trainers, veterinarians, handlers, whoever, the, whoever it is, these are the ones that they tend to miss most often. So yes, we can troubleshoot all of this, 
And we always go back to the basics. Let's identify what's exactly going on. Let's make sure we're avoiding. Let's make sure we're doing our setup so we can get the repetition. We're setting expectations appropriately. And we're practicing so the animal actually has a chance to do what it is that we want them to do. And as we work through all of that, certainly many of our clients need a whole lot of help. Uh, and so we do the best we can to provide that for them. Thank you all for coming very much.